Bibles to John chapter 8. And we'll be picking up from where we left off last week when John uh, chapter 8 verse 12 through 30 is where our text is this morning. And the title of this message is Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. It says in verse 12, and Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And the Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you don't know where I came from and where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I'm not alone, but I am with the father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself and the father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, where is your father? And Jesus answered and says, you neither nor me or more know my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And these words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no one laid hands on him for his hour had not yet come. And then Jesus answered, said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You're of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, you said that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Then they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I have been saying from the very beginning. I have many things to say. And judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true. And I speak the world to those things which I heard from him. And they didn't understand what he spoke to them of the father. And then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. But the father taught me and I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. And the father's not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. And as he spoke those words. Many believed in him. Let's pray. Father, as we open up your word, that you would teach us, that you would instruct us, that you would fill us with your spirit. Thank you for this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. As you know, the setting is still in Jerusalem. It's toward and during and the part of the Feast of the Tabernacles, which we've been discussing for the last several weeks. And the Feast of Tabernacles was taking place in the fall time. And it was a week where the Jewish people would camp under the stars, under these tents and booths that they had set up uh, to remember those 40 years that the uh, Israelites were traveling through the wilderness, that God, uh, before they came into the promised land. And as we saw it last week in verse 2, it was early in the morning when he had this interesting encounter uh, when he was in the temple and he began to teach. And then he was interrupted, as you know, by these Pharisees who were enemies of Jesus. And Jesus had a powerful and well-placed opponents who stood uh, to lose everything if Jesus prevailed. So they did everything they could to stop Jesus, to, uh, to, to catch him in something. And the, the stark contrast is to see the compelling message uh, of God's redeeming love. And then you see the sleazy tactics of these religious elite people. And so they tried to confront him verbally. And every time they, they tried to set a trap for them, he turned it back on them. And so this encounter with the scribes and the Pharisees uh, marks one of those uh, interesting turns where you start to see this downward path a little bit further for the scribes and the Pharisees. And there is no depth to which they wouldn't stoop to try to stop Jesus and to trap him. The plan was to present Jesus with a false dilemma. And so the woman they brought to Jesus, they said that was guilty of the crime of adultery. And that she was caught in her act. And the penalty under the law was death. But how were they able to catch her in this act? Well, only if they could really set it up, they could do that. 
And be, maybe the, the, the crime had been committed with one of the Pharisees. Maybe uh, she was the wife of one of the men there. Maybe it was just a, a whole other plot that was developed. Was she married? Was the other guy was married? We don't know the full story. Uh, but what we do know is that these religious leaders were so desperate as they were dangerous. How would Jesus handle the situation? Because under the law of Moses, had she committed this crime, it was punishable by death. And if Jesus dismissed the law, he would suffer the rage of the the Jewish crowd. If he let them stone her, then this message of love and forgiveness would be compromised. So it's an interesting dilemma here. But Jesus used this as a, a teachable moment. There's a bigger picture involved in that particular story. As we already, Jesus told Nicodemus, who was one of their own, he was a Pharisee. And he didn't come, as Jesus said, he didn't come to heap more condemnation uh, already on the world. His message was to save the world, not to condemn it. And so this woman was no more guiltier than these men, these Pharisees. They're all guilty, right? Both the religious and the ir- irreligious need grace. They need forgiveness. They need hope. And so this situation cut right through the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Hypocrisy, as you know, it's those who claim to have moral standards, but yet they don't live by those standards. They say one thing and do another. Uh, In a perfect description of the, the teachers of the Jewish leaders demanding judgment for the adulterous woman. And so Jesus knew their heart. He knew the motivations of their, and he's not going to be trapped by them. He's not going to get, tra- you know, tangled up in this little, you know, well laid up moral trap that they're trying to throw at Jesus. Instead, he used this occasion as an opportunity to teach them about the nature of God's grace. That's the story behind the, the first 11 verses. But notice what Jesus said to them in verse 11 or verse 7. I'm sorry. Verse 7, where he says, that if any of you is without sin, be the first to throw the stone at her. So in other words, if you're without sin, if you're up without sin, you can throw the stone. And so was he asking if someone was capable of committing the crime, perhaps? But basically, he just cut right to the truth. Everyone's guilty. He was leading them to the conclusion that no one was qualified to sit in judgment of this woman. And so when invited to cast the first stone, their hypocrisy, their deception was exposed. And so they were not sinless. They were guilty. And so they slithered away in the shadows, leaving only Jesus and this woman. And as only Jesus could do, he extended grace and mercy to this woman, freeing her not only from her past sin, but also the future bondage of those sins that it certainly would create. And so at the same time, he exposed the hypocrisies of those around them. He embarrassed them with the proposition that they too might have their secret sins flash before the world. And so Jesus is that great justifier. He demands and he meets the demands where all else fails. And those in whom he justifies, we must also refrain from judging. And those in whom he calls into relationship and to his side, we must not reject. And so in Christ, the great dilemmas and problems they're dealt with. And so this woman was guilty. The scribes and the Pharisees were guilty. The onlooking crowd was guilty. The point is, all of us are guilty. But here's the thing. We're all loved as we are, not as we ought to be. He loves us where we're at. We don't have to clean up our act before we come to Christ. He takes us as we are, and then he cleans up our act. No one wants their sin projected on a screen before the world, do we? And so the truth is, we've all broken God's law. We must all be judged. But the good news, my friends, is that our sin has been paid for on the cross of Calvary. All our guilt before God has been taken care of. Jesus word for us today is neither do I condemn you go and sin no more like it was to this woman. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a powerful word for us today. This can set you free. This can bring you hope and healing. 
And so John, he picks up the dialogue that Jesus had with the Pharisees. Notice verse 12. He spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. And he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And this was a bold statement that I am the light of the world. Now, this was in the backdrop of the light from the temple in the courtyard. In the temple, there is this menorah, this golden candlestick. It's a lot bigger than this little thing. This is just a little mini representation that you can buy in Israel. And uh, But they had these were huge at the time. And it would light this whole temple area, which is probably 10 times bigger than the gem that we're in right now. And so in the backdrop, that was what was happening. That was going on. And so this light, as you know, commemorated the pillar of fire uh, that led the Israelites when they were wandering through the wilderness in Moses' day. And so it is in that context that Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So in that short sentence, it set off a chain reaction. Fireworks went off when Jesus says, I am, because it made it clear that he is God. The Jewish people understood that light that stood for God's holiness and truth. And if that wasn't enough, when Jesus claimed to be the light for all people, not just the Jews. And so as the light pierces the darkness, Jesus sheds light on God, showing people what he is like and what he does. So Jesus' presence and his teaching sheds light on the darkness of people's sin and separation from the Lord. And so people who follow Jesus, you don't walk blindly in sin anymore. Instead, you see your sin and your need for forgiveness. This also is the second I am statements that Jesus mentions in the Gospel of John. As you know, there's seven I am statements. The first one we came to in John chapter six, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So he's everything that we need. He's our source and substance and life. Here he says, I am the light of the world. In chapter 10, we're going to see two more where he says, I am the door. And then he says, I am the good shepherd. Chapter 11, he will say, I am the resurrection and the life. Chapter 14, he will say, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father, but by me. Chapter 15 will be the last one where he says, I am the true vine. And they all have significance and meaning. And in claiming to be the light of the world, Jesus defines his unique position as the one true light for all people, not just the Jews. The Bible says in Isaiah 49, 6, I will give you the light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And here's the thing. Death brings eternal darkness. But to follow Jesus means to never walk in darkness, but to have the light of life. And so when we follow Jesus and we accept him as our Lord and Savior and following him, we're walking as in the light. And we no longer walk blindly in our sin, but rather his light shows us our sin and our need for forgiveness. And he guides us along the paths and leads us into eternal life with him. The Bible says in Psalm uh, 36, 9, it says, in your light, we see light. So the theme that we're going to see here in this chapter and also in chapter nine is that uh, it, it, he, he, he's going to talk about how Jesus heals the blind man. And he also mentions that he is the, the light of the world. Now, keep in mind that this phrase I am is the same phrase that was told to Moses when he was to go talk to the children of Israel. And, and who should uh, uh, believe me and, and, and uh, uh, who say that who's to deliver them from the Egyptian people and and the basic name of who God is. And so this is what God told Moses at the burning bush. When Moses asked God his name, he says this in chapter three, verse 13 says that Moses said to God, indeed, when I came to the children of Israel, say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me and said to me, what is his name? What what shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, you shall say to the children of Israel, I am sent you. So it was the very name of who God is, the representation of God. Now, when it comes to the light, and there's several ideas of meaning of light here. Number one, it's illumination, because here's the thing. Light helps us see things clearly. Light helps us see things clearly. So there's an illumination. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 130 says the entrance of your word gives light and gives understanding to the simple. For example, when you're sitting in a dark room, it's hard to make things out. Uh, You might hear a noise, but you don't know what it is until you turn on the light. 
Or you might have one of those micro-sized little splinters in your hand, but you can't see it clearly until you have the light on and you can see more clearly. Or imagine driving down a road at night without any headlights on. You know, it's just dangerous. You, you feel trapped. You feel you can't move anymore if you don't have the light. We need the light. Light also speaks of purity. Light speaks of righteousness. In fact, uh, turn to John chapter 3. So just a couple chapters to the left. John chapter 3. In verse 19. And this is what Jesus says. And this is that continued conversation that he had with Nicodemus. And he says this in verse 19. He says, this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love their darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they may be done in God. Back to John chapter 8. Have you ever wondered why evil, scary movies are always shot at night? I mean, there's nothing scary about if it's shot during the day. Not that I would say, hey, go see an evil, scary horror movie. But it's like there's nothing scary about it during the day. Only at night does it become that and carry on that that attitude. But when Jesus says that he is the light of the world, he's not only saying that he's the Messiah, but he is also the light of purity and holiness. And that is light gives men a chance to have direction for their lives. And when we say, you know, uh, when you come to Christ, it's it's like the light comes on, right? It's like your perspective changes. That's what happens. Now, as verse 12 goes on to say, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The word follows here, it's a uh, in the Greek tenses, it indicates a continuous action, uh, a continuous following moment by moment, day by day. And if you go into the woods at night and you're with someone and they have a torch and as long as you stay close to them, you can see where you're going. But if you stop following them, then you find yourself in darkness, right? Like this woman that's been brought before Jesus, most likely she was walking in darkness. And for the first time, the lights have come on. The question for her and for anyone is, will that light stay on then? There's lessons in walking in light. Uh, If we're following Jesus, two things are going to happen. Number one, you're going to have this growing sense of direction, this growing sense of illumination and perspective. When following Jesus, we may not have all the answers, yet he is the answer for everything that pertains to life and godliness. Um, But yet more things uh, make more sense. We're not going to understand everything the scriptures tell us, right? We're still trying to figure things out. But we still know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That The word begins to put a light into our lives. And it begins to show us what path that we're walking on. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 105, that your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. The second thing that happens is that there's this growing sense of right and wrong. This, that purity. And, and coming to Jesus involves coming into the light. And one of the things that, um, you know, that you, you do maybe in secretly becomes exposed. He, he touches you on the heart. He says, hey, this thing, it, it's not good. It's not pleasing. You know, it's not, you know, according to what my will is for your life or whatever sin that we're struggling with. He sheds light into to that. And, um, and, and we call that truth. You know, he's speaking truth to us. Truth is also um, means not hidden. And so it's a good definition of being in the light where things are not hidden. Um, and, and then sharing the truth with one another, we speak the truth in what? Love. You know, that we may grow up in all things into him who is head, Christ. And so growing up in Christ involves the truth, walking in the truth, walking in the light. It means that we stop hiding from our sins and learning to face them. And so wh- what are you going to do when your sins exposed? That's where we're all confronted with from time to time. And as Christians, we need to have our sin exposed so we can draw closer to the Lord. With that in mind, turn to 1 John chapter 1 for a moment. So if you go to the book of Revelation and then you turn over a couple books to the left, 1 John. 1 John chapter 1 verse 5. 
He says, this is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Back to John chapter 8. So here's the thing. Walking in the light brings complete cleansing. It, it, It brings forgiveness. And as long as you respond to the light... Confess your sin and move away from your sin that you're going to experience that that cleansing. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses a man from all sin. But we also and here's the other catch is we have to take responsibility for our sin and our actions and behavior going all the way back to Adam and Eve in Genesis. They did everything they could to avoid to take responsibility for their actions and for their sin. Adam blamed his wife. You know, she gave me of that tree. Right. He even pointed, you know, accusing fingers at God, saying, that's the woman you gave me. Eve blamed the serpent, saying, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And here's the thing. God ignored their excuses and announced the judgment that they would face as consequences for their disobedience. The problem with so many people is that they refuse to take responsibility for their actions and behavior. They want to blame everyone else. They want to blame their parents for not raising them well. They want to blame their friends for letting them down. Uh, They want to blame their pastor for not being good enough or whatever else. Their children are rebellious. Their employer is not sensitive enough. Their spouse is not understanding. There's not enough time in the day to go through all the excuses that you can name. Yet forgiveness and restoration cannot happen until we take full responsibility for our actions and behavior. It's obvious indication that we have not genuinely repented if we make excuses for our sinful behavior. We don't have to have excuses before the Lord. He knows it all. Nowhere in Scripture, by the way, does God excuse one's personal sin because of someone else's actions. Nowhere. You're never going to find it. And if we make a habit, listen, of blaming other people for our failures, we will never reach that point of honest repentance which God, he's going to hold us accountable for our own actions and behavior, not others. And to for us to always strive to acknowledge and take responsibility for our sins. And it will free you to receive God's forgiveness and to press on to spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity also, while we're thinking about it, is how do you respond when you're offended? How do you respond? How are you going to handle it? You know, what do you do? And here's the thing, where there's sin forgiveness where there's a wound there needs to be healing and when there's a a, a bondage there needs to be deliverance and you need to be set free so those are some of the areas that happen in everyone's life at some degree so this woman as we know who was caught in adultery uh, has now found herself standing in the light of jesus christ is she going to respond Uh, will she follow the light And just like a flower, it's not going to blossom without sunlight. Our lives will never be what it ought to be without Jesus Christ. And as a matter of fact, people without Jesus would do anything they can to try to figure out their confused and disoriented lives. They're finding they're trying to satisfy their life and all kinds of things out there, always to wind up empty and void. Without Jesus, people are just going through life blindfolded. They're driving through life blindfolded. And and you know where they're going to end up. They're going to crash and burn literally and also spiritually. Verse 13 of chapter 8 continues. It says, the Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I came from and where I'm going. So if you notice the um, the Pharisees immediate hostility toward Jesus, it seems that they were against him for anything and everything. And no matter what he did, they're against Jesus. 
You know, whatever he said, even the miracles that Jesus did, none of them was good enough for them to consider them through their uh, and their twisted opinion of who Jesus is. It's because they clearly understood that Jesus claimed to be God. That word light there, as we've mentioned before, according to Jewish terminology uh, in Scripture, is that it's a title that reserved for one person, and that is God. So when Jesus claimed to be the light of the world, you know, these legalistic Pharisees knew what he meant and they hated him all the more for it. And as you notice, starting in verse 13, there's going to be six stages of rejection in this chapter. The first one here, where they're trying to catch Jesus in a contradiction, you're going to see, secondly, in verse 19 and 41, their cynicism toward Jesus, where they're saying, oh, where's your father? You know, you know, we're not born of fornication. So they're kind of cynical about who Jesus is. And then in verse 33, you're going to notice there's the denial. There's the denial aspect. And then verse 48, you, they have an insult. Insult where uh, he said, oh, you're a Samaritan. You have a demon. So they're trying to insult Jesus. Uh, fifthly, you start to see sarcasm in verse 53 it says, uh, you know, who do you make yourself out to be? So there's always sarcasm in that. And so you start to see people's rejection of people as they go along these steps as well. And then the, the last one is violence, where uh, verse 59, where it says they, they took up stones to throw at him, even though he escaped from them. But you see, it leads to violence because they're not getting all their way. So even there, there, there was truth to what the Pharisees were saying, um, because a, a person bears witness of themselves doesn't mean that they're telling a lie. It's OK to bear witness of what you're saying. You're, you're not necessarily lying. But Jesus goes on to say, uh, Jesus knows who he is, where he came from and where he's going. So in verse 13, the Pharisees were actually quoting Jesus's word from back in chapter uh, five, verse 31. But he quickly refuted their argument. And one of the other key words as we're going through this passage is uh, the word witness. So as you're going to see witness, witness, witness several times here, it's used some six times in this particular passage. And Jesus says, notice verse 15, you judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. So the word flesh here means that physical nature, man's sinful nature. Another way of phrasing is you judge me by human standards. So that's the idea here. And Jesus made it clear that their witness was not dependable because their judgment was faulty. So they judged on the basis of, of external human judgment, human nature. But Jesus judges based on spiritual knowledge and truth. And the way they judged the, the woman in adultery proved that they neither understood the law and they had their twisted, sinful hearts as well through this whole process. The Pharisees were living examples of flawed judgment. They had brought this adulterous woman before Jesus, but they weren't trying to help this woman. Right. So you never see them trying to minister to her and help her through this process. But in reality, here's the thing. We all have flawed judgments. We're all limited by our human understanding. And uh, we, too, can fall into the trap of sizing up people according to our standards, our human judgment. And so when Jesus says, I judge no one, what he is saying, given in the context, uh, Jesus meant that while his accusers were judging by human standards, he did not. So that's the idea behind that. Because here's the thing. It's so easy to judge and criticize people, especially when you don't have all the facts or the other side of the story or the situation. It's easy to jump in there and criticize and attack. Because I think when the first time when you read through this passage and dealing with the adulterous woman, you know, we start to blame her and what she went through and all that other stuff without understanding all the context behind it all. And so Jesus had already told them, uh, not to judge by appearances and, and and they continue to do so. They continue to judge by outward appearance. And so it's that lesson that you learn in the Old Testament, first Samuel sixteen seven, where it says the Lord does not see as man sees. They look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So before we uh, make judgment, let's be very careful in making judgment about someone and their circumstances. And uh, sometimes we need to exercise a little more caution and compassion instead of jumping down someone's throat. So and again, it depends on the circumstance in those situations. Verse 16 says, if I don't judge, my judgment is true for our, I am not alone. For I am with the father who sent me and it is written in your law that the testimonies of two men is true. 
So Jesus reserved for himself the right to judge. And, um, but this, as you know, wasn't the primary reason for his coming. Uh, Jesus didn't come to judge, but to save. In fact, he already told Nicodemus, the, the well-known Pharisee, back in chapter 3, verse 16, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 goes on to say, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it, you know, through him. So as the son of man, Jesus Christ has been given the authority to judge. But when the, and it's when that future day comes. Jesus is going to judge according to the Father's will when he does judge. And therefore, it could be said that when Jesus didn't come to judge, but his coming did lead to judgment because it forces a decision. Everyone that encounters Jesus, you're forced with a decision. And a rejection of Jesus leads to judgment. And so in verse 17, uh, carries the idea uh, also, as we mentioned before about the Old Testament, that you can't charge a person's crime with only one person's testimony. So it takes the testimony of two people to establish the fact, and that's out of Deuteronomy 19. He goes on to say, verse 18, I am the one who bears witness of myself, and my Father who sent me bears witness of me. So here Jesus' second witness is the Father. And then they said to him, where is your Father? Jesus answered and says, you neither know me nor my father, for if you have known me, you would have known my father also. So you see the cynicism of the Pharisees here, which is that other stage of rejection. Where is your father? Because they knew the circumstances behind Jesus's birth, as you'll see in verse 41. And they were probably aware that Joseph, his earthly father, had died. So the question here was more of a kind of a backhand slur. Uh, delivered kind of like as an inside joke. And perhaps their insult came with a little wink and kind of a, a knowing look. And so Jesus ignored the insult and he responded with a rebuke, as you see. And anyone who believed that J Joseph had fathered Jesus clearly didn't know the identity of Jesus's uh, real father, uh, nor did he or she know God personally. So the second statement, as you notice there, if you know me, you would have known my father also. So here Jesus declared himself to be the means of knowing God personally, because Jesus is the perfect representation of the father. And since Jesus said that he had a second witness, the leaders were, OK, where is this mystery man? Where is your father then? Where is he? And they couldn't get out of that literal rut. By refusing to consider Jesus' father was God. And obviously they didn't know Jesus nor the father. And it's kind of like whenever you debate people. A lot of times the opponents start to attack you personally. Instead of the, the topic of debate. You know, because they have nowhere else to go. And so you, you find these religious and, and, and Old Testament law experts starting to do these personal slings and slurs against Jesus. And they intended this to be these deep cutting insults to him. And yet, you know, they, they, they refer to his virgin birth or or rumors that it was just it wasn't a miraculous conception, but it was an illegitimate one. And so you would think that these blind sinners would want to come to the light to Jesus. But that's not not the case. They're coming to the true light brought conflict as the powers of darkness opposed it. And so rather they make fun of the gospel. They make fun of the truth. They make fun of, you know, the Bible. That's what people do instead of trying to comprehend it. But how tragic it is for these experts in the law. They didn't know their own Messiah was standing in front of them. They claimed to know the law of God, but they didn't know the God of the law. They didn't have his word abiding in their hearts, nor did they experience his love. They didn't know the father and therefore they didn't know the son. And so Jesus doesn't necessarily answer the question, where's your father? But here's the thing. He does in an indirect way. He, the, the word father is used some 21 times in this chapter. Uh, so Jesus didn't he didn't avoid the issue, but he did face it head on. Uh, he he knew that their father was not God, but the devil. And we're going to see that later on, uh, that these men uh, were religious. They were children of the devil. And so whenever Jesus taught a spiritual truth, his listeners interpreted in a kind of a material, physical way. 
And so the light of God was unpenetrable into their darkness at this point or in their minds. And they chose to hide in their spiritual you know, dungeons, if you will. So they didn't have to hear the truth. And right now, there's some that may be here, some listening online or on YouTube or our radio program, and they're hiding in their own spiritual dungeon so they don't have to hear the truth of God. And here's the thing, my friends. He wants to set you free from anything that's hindering you. If you're in bondage or Satan's got a a grip on you, you don't have to live in darkness anymore. You can step out of the darkness and into the light of the world and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, notice what happens that um, these words that Jesus spoke in the treasury, he taught in the temple and no one laid hands on him for his hour had not yet come. So this discussion took place in this open court, which was the court of the women. There's several different courts in the temple area. But this is where this particular place was uh, situation was taking place and it was near the offering boxes there was a um you know a lot of boxes around the, this area but one of the places in this situation there's a lot of people in the crowds um the crowds were there men and women were allowed in this place and there's these 13 trumpet shaped collection boxes inscribed with the money a deposit into it. Seven were for uh, temple tax and the other six were for offerings. And so the leaders here, they could have easily grabbed Jesus, but it wasn't his time for his arrest. And then Jesus said to them, verse 21, I'm going away and you'll seek me and you'll die in your sins for where uh, where I go, you cannot come. And so Jesus is speaking to the people who will not believe. And so they're going to die in their sins because they refuse to believe in the Savior. So where is he going? He's going to go to heaven, as we'll know. Verse 22 continues. So the Jews, will he kill himself because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I'm not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So if these religious leaders, they're not going to believe in Jesus while he's in front of them, there's a good chance they're not going to believe after he's gone as well. You know, they're not going to believe in uh, Christ for their salvation. So and as usual, they don't have a clue what he's talking about. They thought he was going to commit suicide. So instead of trying to correct their misinterpretation here, Jesus told them why they didn't get it. They were tied to the earth with no understanding of spiritual truth. He was from heaven with the perspective outside of their closed box thinking. Not believing in Jesus equals spiritual death. It's only when we place our faith and trust in him as our savior, uh, you know, that uh, we gain that spiritual life. So uh, Jesus in this situation, in this context, uh, could be implying, unless you believe that I am the Messiah, you will die in your sins. Or he could be saying, unless you believe that I am, I am, you will die in your sins. So either way, you see that there's a connection there. And when he says you're going to die in your sins, so if you don't believe in Jesus, when, when you die, you will have your sins with you and you'll have to stand before God and you'll have to pay the price for those sins. But if you come to faith in Jesus Christ, that, that's been paid for for you. You, you receive that. So when God judges people, he does not use that the balance and weights of your good deeds against your, you know, your bad deeds. You will have to pay for your sins if you don't believe in Jesus Christ. And there's a serious price tag to that for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. If you die in your sins, you will have to pay with an eternal uh, separation from God in hell. But if you believe in Jesus, your debt has already been paid. And when you arrive before the judge, there will be a ticket, if you will, stamped paid in full because it was paid in full by Jesus on the cross. And so verse 25 goes on to say, when they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I've been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say to you who judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. So I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. And they didn't understand what he spoke to them of the father. So their con- this conversation went over their head. Uh, they didn't get it. So then they have this try to this direct approach. Well, who are you? And, and they didn't get the answer that they wanted. Jesus insisted that he is exactly who he's been saying he is all along. His, his answer never changed here. 
Instead of continuing in this kind of fruitless uh, discussion, Jesus took the high road. And he didn't say uh, any more that would kind of condemn them in that sense. Instead, he would speak to them what God told him to speak to the world, not just the Jewish people. And again, a lot of times we're just not going to understand all the things that Jesus says. But we will once we're in heaven. But these, you know, these, these other people here, these Pharisees, were totally clueless because they have no spiritual understanding. They didn't have the Holy Spirit like we have. So we have a, a much better understanding of scriptures. And so Jesus says to them, verse 28, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you know that I am he and that I do those things of myself. <coughs> but as my father taught me, I speak these things. So again, the Pharisees still didn't get it and what Jesus told them about his relationship with the Father. And so Jesus mentions the ultimate proof, the resurrection uh, after the, the crucifixion. So when uh, that happened, they will know for sure that he was telling the truth and that uh, he wasn't operating alone. And, and as well, we'll see that some of the hard-hearted, even the dense group, that some of them finally believed. And so Jesus is saying, after I'm raised from the dead, then you'll know that my claims are true. The word also lifted up, uh, as Jesus says in John chapter 12, he says, when I am lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all people to myself. And he said this signifying by what death he would die. So he's talking about his death being crucified here. And then he, uh, verse 29 goes on to say, And then he who sent me is with me, and the Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. And as he spoke these words, many believed in him. So here's the thing. Jesus' relationship with God the Father was very intimate. It was very close. And each of these expressions was really a claim of equality with God. And throughout all his earthly ministry, the father was always with Jesus. At no time was Jesus left alone. So all the times he did those things that were pleasing to the Lord. And so these words could not be spoken by a sinless being. You know, ones that for any one of us, because no one born of human parents could ever utter those words. I always do those things that please my parents, right? Or, or please others or please the Lord for that matter. Too often we do those things that please ourselves or we sometimes are prompted to please other people. But only Jesus Christ was completely taken up with the desire to do those things that were well pleasing to the Lord. And as he spoke these things, many believed in him. That's one of the, the coolest statements that you, you see here, that many believed in him. Some probably had genuine faith. Others probably may have only been prompted to give lip service in that situation, but maybe there was no real heart behind it. And again, this this crowd was huge that was around Jesus and some of the crowd that believed in his word and they put their faith in him. And often the people that you witness to, they don't become Christians, but sometimes it's those that are listening, the eavesdropping in that conversation, they get convicted and they get saved. So you never know when that happens or if that happens. And if you remember the parable of the soil, soil, you know, there's four different types of soil. But what happened? The guy was just throwing out the seeds wherever he could. Some were falling on this type of soil, some falling on that type of soil, some sprouted up but because of the cares of this world and compromise and difficulty. It falls away. But that which falls on good soil produces the, the good fruit. But our job is to spread the word, to spread out, to share the gospel to as many people as possible. It is God and his sovereign choice and decision to decide who receives and who doesn't. You know, we still got to be remain faithful to to spread the gospel. The question for everyone is, do you believe, though? Do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in the word? Salvation is a matter of life and death. And people who live in their sins and reject the Savior, they're going to die in their sins. And there's no alternative. And so either we receive salvation by grace and experience, you know, his love and forgiveness, or you experience the condemnation under God's law. Either you're walking in the light and having eternal life or you're walking in darkness and experiencing eternal death. Those are the two options for people in this world. So as we consider this message and how it might apply to our lives, I would encourage you to, first of all, never be afraid of the shining light of God in your life. You know, through the shining light you know, his light in our lives, it, sometimes it can be painful, it's convicting. But here's the thing, 
it also not only shows us of our sin, but it shows us our way out of it as well. Um, he wants to set us free from whatever sin that is as well. But remember, the light should never be feared. The light of God brings true knowledge and holiness and happiness when you're walking in the light. The opposite is also true. If you're walking in darkness, it brings blindness. It brings ignorance and guilt and uh, depravity and hardship and misery. And I think the most miserable people in the world are are, uh, backslidden Christians. They've got to be because they know the truth and yet they're not living it. And they're just under the condemnation. Why would anyone be willing to walk in darkness? We need to stay focused on the true light, Jesus Christ. Reminded of a story of a man who was driving through this mining region one Sunday, and he noticed a, a large number of mules in the field. And as he inquired about this unusual sight, he was told that they were work animals that had been brought up from the dark passages below to preserve their eyesight. And unless they were regularly exposed to the sunlight, they eventually would go blind. And just as Christians, we need that continued light exposure to Jesus Christ, keeping our eyes fixed upon him as the author and finisher of our faith. And so walk as children of light, seeking to know him, to serve him, to do those things that are pleasing to him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you are the light of the world. Thank you for saving us and forgiving us and redeeming us. We pray that we would shed your light on others around us, whether they're family members or friends or co-workers, whatever it is, that we would shed your light everywhere we go. That you continue to open those doors and opportunities for us to share the gospel. And so we thank you that you're in control. You are sovereign. May you have your way in our lives and in this church. In Jesus' name, amen. So